let's get started to make the most of our, our one hour together. So just to make sure everyone knows the space they're in, I know it's tough with the virtual space we've been hopping around, um, but you are in one of the morning breakout sessions. So this one is a space where we'll spend the next hour together learning and reflecting on the politics of technology creation and on the path forward towards technology for belonging. I'm really, really excited for the speakers that we've brought together um, to, to talk on this on this topic. We're really happy also to be able to provide closed captioning. So I'm dropping the link now so that you have that and I'll pin it as well. Um, that's the link to follow along with, with closed captioning. So some quick housekeeping things as we get started. Um, like I said, we, we have an hour for this session and we, we want to get a chance to hear um, deeply about the speaker's work. And so we'd love for you to use the chat box to stay engaged and we'll hopefully get some time for questions. But if not, use that chat to start reflecting and posing questions for future discussion and shared learning. So to kick us off, we will do a quick round of introductions. I'm just putting names up here so you get a sense of who you're going to, to learn from today and learn with. I'll kick us off here. I, like I said, my name is Emmett Almadon. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a research analyst at the Othering and Belonging Institute. We're also getting into the habit of using um, a visual description to, to make sure that folks get an, an image of, of the folks on screen. I'm a light-skinned black woman with uh, curly black hair piled up on a bun on top of my head. I'm really happy to be here with you all. I'll pass it to Brandy to introduce herself. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Brandi Gerkink. Um, I work as an advocate and campaigner with the Mozilla Foundation, studying social media algorithms and advocating for better um, corporate practices and policies. Um, I am a white woman. I have blonde hair, and I'm wearing a black jumper. Um, and I'll pass to Minister Sherry. Thank you, Brandi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Minister Sherry Murphy. I'm a lead organizer with Gig Workers Rising based out here in Oakland, California. Um, I am a black woman uh, wearing glasses uh, with a deep purple blouse and sweater and a curly fro. And I will pass it on um, to my brother. Thank you, Sherry. Um... Hi everyone, I'm Subhashish. I'm based in Bangalore, India. Um, and um, I co-founded the O Foundation. And we work, uh, we focus mostly um, in many topics in the intersections of digital rights and um, uh, indigenous languages and low resource languages. Um, I am a South Asian uh, uh, man uh, with uh, dark complexion, I'm wearing glasses i'm i'm wearing a black t-shirt i'll pass it on to sajia my name is i'm a nation of pc berkeley uh, my research is a harm social media and content modeling uh, and i'm a asian woman uh, i have ponytail and i'm wearing a blue dress with on it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for doing those introductions and thank you to our audience. Please keep introducing yourself through the chat box and engaging throughout the session. So we're really excited to have you here today. So we're going to, the way this session will go is I'll, I'll give a couple of quick remarks at the beginning just to, to orient us to the topic. Um, I'm sure we're coming from different directions and different experiences on thinking about this world of technology and ethics and power, um, and our speakers will be wonderful guides through this. Um, after that, each of our speakers will take about five minutes to share on a topic of their work on a project that they've done in the past or in the future. And then we'll go into a, a short discussion amongst all the speakers and myself moderating and then I'll, that will close us out for, for our one hour. So I will start with just, as you, see in, saw, as you saw in the title of our session, we really want to focus on 
politics and power dynamics of how technology is created. We want to emphasize that we're in a really critical moment where the valuation of large tech companies and the value of data as a commodity has been explosive. That's something that especially for folks based in the Bay Area, we know plenty about, but it's, it's the power that these tech companies have across um, the nation and across the world is only growing. And so to ground us and why we want to focus on the topic of politics and power, I just want to walk through a couple of examples that will highlight and maybe preview a bit of what we'll, we'll hear from our, our speakers. But of course, they'll bring in other topics and, and questions and reflections for us. So I want to start with one example, um, and it speaks a lot to Minister Sherry's work and the work of the gig workers rising. Um, our California audience may remember Prop 22, this ballot proposition that passed in 2020 that allowed rideshare drivers, rideshare or gig worker companies rather, to classify employees as independent contractors. And we will have a discussion and have space to, to hear more about that. But what I wanna point our attention to throughout this is the amount of money and power that went into this campaign. It was one of the most well-funded um, ballot measure campaigns in California history actually, it was the last stat that I saw. Um, so use that as kind of a, a prompting question of why so much money on redefining the role, the, the labor roles in this country. The other topic that has been front of mind for a lot of us in the midst of contested elections, political turmoil in the US and in Brazil and in India, and in this moment of uh, collectively trying to make sense of the global pandemic unfolding is the role of online misinformation and the role of content moderation, which Shijia will, will speak about uh, a new vision of what it could look like in the future. Much dialogue has rightfully focused on the use of algorithms by these tech companies to amplify and suppress content online. For folks that made it to our panel this morning, you might have seen um, Dr. Crockett speak a little bit on this, on the role of algorithms that tend to heighten emotions and push us into binary thinking. And there's so much we may not understand about these algorithms, but they shape what we see, what our children see, what, what, what is most front of mind for us sometimes. We'll learn more about this through Brandy's presentation. I wanna also continue to emphasize the power and politics angle of all of this. Who is behind some of these, these tools and these, uh, these practices of content moderation? So while we also talk about algorithms, that human moderators continue to play a huge role in content moderation, and it's a demanding role. This is just one example of um, a, an outsourced content moderator um, organization in, in the Philippines where you can kind of get a sense of through this stat, the difference in payment rates of salaries across these tech companies with Facebook as an example. But I really wanna emphasize and what we'll turn to through our conversation today that is intentionally uses the word reimagining is that with all these examples of so much that tech companies and that this, the current system of technology creation has created, there is beautiful resistance and reimagining happening all around us. So these are just a couple of examples here and we'll hear so much more of visions and coalitions and possibilities today, um, but coalitions are being built constantly across communities to educate each other on the harm caused by today's system of technology creation. This is an example from Mijente, one of our partners on the No Tech for ICE campaign. Civil society is fighting back to demand greater transparency from tech companies, new frameworks of human and civil rights in the digital realm, and pushing us to think about the power of open source technology, of common space knowledge, which we'll learn through Subhashish's work. And workers at tech companies have been fighting back and building power, as we'll learn through Minister Sherry's work. So as an institute, we're really excited to bring together this group of speakers to share how they're using research, organizing, coalition buildings, art forms like filmmaking to move us towards technology from belonging. And for our audience, we really wanna emphasize for, for you and for all of us that there's a role for all of us in this future from wherever we are positioned that will require us to bridge and see each other's humanity in the physical space or in the digital space. From understanding the experience of a rideshare driver, the experience of a member of a minority group or minority groups across the globe whose language and experience is not represented in today's digital world. 
So some of the questions that we'll begin answering together today through our speakers and through our dialogue, how can we use technology to bridge divides and to include those on the margins? How is technology for belonging created differently than technology that others? How can we better understand the technology tools that we use or that are used on us? So I will turn it over to our speakers now to take about five minutes each to respond to these prompts um, and share a little bit about a past, future, or present project that speaks to these questions that we've just laid out and, and this moment that we're in. So I'll pass it first to Brandy. Great, thank you so much, Emna, and for the opportunity to be here. Um, I want to start off by reading a story that someone sent me. They wrote, in coming out to myself and close friends as transgender, my biggest regret was turning to YouTube to hear the stories of other trans and queer people. Simply typing in the word transgender brought up countless videos that were essentially describing my struggle as a mental illness and as something that shouldn't exist. Nations were full of anti-LGBTQ hateful content that followed me for ages after. YouTube reminded me why I hid in the closet for so many years. This story was sent to me as part of a campaign that I developed at the Mozilla Foundation called YouTube Regrets. YouTube Regrets is part of Mozilla's broader work to advocate for more trustworthy AI systems. We focus on crowdsourcing people's stories about the impact of YouTube's recommendations on their lives um, because it's one of the most significant consequential AI systems that consumers interface with. So YouTube is the second most visited website in the world and their recommendation engine drives more than 700 a day of watch time on the platform. So just to speak a little bit um, to how it actually works, um, YouTube's recommendation engine uses a technique that's called collaborative filtering to, to deliver recommendations. So it basically means that they collect a bunch of data about you and what you like to watch, and then they compare that to data about other people um, and what those people like to watch in order to deliver you recommendations that they think that you might watch based on their assessment of who you are and who other people who they think might be like you are. And the way that this can go really wrong really quickly is when that technology reflects and actually amplifies harmful patterns that are already present within society, like transphobia in the earlier example. As a result of these techniques, recommender systems can really quickly lead people into harmful rabbit holes that actually reflect more division than they do connection. Um, and one thing to mention, it's not just sort of algorithms left to their own devices, but rather companies and people within companies are constantly manipulating these algorithms in ways that they don't disclose to serve a particular objective. So sometimes people talk about the way that are optimized to keep eyes on the screen. People consume you know, more advertisements and the platform makes more money. But other ways that algorithms are manipulated by companies is for instance, um, during times of political or social unrest or turmoil, elections are a really good example of that. So for example, Facebook have said that have admitted that they sort of turn up or turn down the dials on the spread of toxic content on the platform, depending on, you know, things like what is happening in the United States on a particular moment. For me, this really begs the question of how those decisions are made. So who is getting to when the dials are turned in what direction and what is even considered to be toxic content? Um, and the reality is that those decisions are made within, you know, boardrooms in Silicon very, very few people um, on decisions that are highly consequential for all of our societies. So uh, we desperately need more transparency is what I'm, what I'm saying into how these decisions are, are actually being made. And that's why me and my team at Mozilla, um, we built upon our original story collection campaign to run a deeper investigation into YouTube. We built a browser extension that we called the YouTube Regrets Reporter. We thought if thousands of people would send us their stories about 
um, their experiences on YouTube? Could we get them to share with us actual data, actual evidence about the rabbit holes that YouTube was sending them down, the types of things that it was recommending? And what would it reveal to us if we put together thousands of examples um, about the way that YouTube is? Yes. Our investigation recruited 1,000 people across 191 countries to share data with us over a 10-month period about their recommendations on YouTube. And what we found was that YouTube was recommending content violated their very own community guidelines, um, which included harmful misinformation. Um, and also, interestingly, that the problem was significantly worse in places where English is not the primary language. Uh, which is really interesting when it when when you think about then the impact of of this globally. Um, so the the few seconds I have left um, with like what can be done. So our campaign is actually about creating greater transparency into how YouTube's algorithm works. But I think that's just step one. Like where we ultimately need to move towards is a place a model where people can actually participate in how those decisions are being made, how those algorithms are governed, um, because they're incredibly consequential for our societies as a whole, and more people need to be involved in, in those decisions. Thank you so much, Brandy. That's a wonderful note to end on, and we'll, we'll absolutely be turning back to that vision of, of a new way of designing and, and governing technology. We'll pass to Minister Sherry now. Thank you, Emin. Thank you, Brandy. Good morning again, everyone. Um, so I would like to begin um, by bringing to the space of the ancestors, um, acknowledging the land on which I'm sitting on this morning is the territory of the Ohlone people, um, the initial stewards of this land before the uh, genocide and occupation due to white supremacy. I also like to acknowledge the enslaved people um, and the ones who built this nation um, based on the historical economic expectation. Um, I wanna thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and building this nation and inspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. I think it's really important to set that tone um, as a basis for racialized capitalism and how it plays up in app-based um, industry. So I wanna address the question that was posed about how can we better understand the technology tools we use or that are used on us. Um, I want to particularly focus on the politics of technology creation and maintenance. And this includes um, ad-based industry. Um, I have a personal story for three years. Um, Lyft was my primary source of income and I completed over 12,000 rides. I was in my last year of my Master's of Divinity and beginning to start my doctoral program back in 2017. Um, at that point, Lyft seemed to be a godsend. They advertised a job with a feature of flexibility that would allow me to make money while also loaning me a rental car. And I was in desperate need of that so-called flexibility and began working with them. But soon I found myself in a deadly and inflexible cycle while it is fair to say that corporations like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and Instacart have transformed transportation and mill delivery, they have done so at a great cost. We must keep in front of us that labor platforms that perform essential services were born from economic instability. The financial burden of the crisis left workers desperate and willing to accept any work, even jobs that bypass employer obligations, and extended no commitment to a safe working environment. Over my time working for Lyft, I've seen many drivers become entrapped in the gig economy where app workers found themselves in a constant cycle of working just to keep working. I witnessed corporations deny unemployment benefits, not providing personal protective equipment, having drivers choose to face a deadly disease in an effort to secure their housing or driving with a looming threat should they get into a car accident um, and not being covered. No access to restrooms, no safety protocol, no discrimination protections. It's important to keep in mind that a majority of this or these workers work full time and yet still qualify for Medi-Cal benefits. 
it's not unusual to have a worker work 60, 70 hour weeks. A majority of them are immigrant of African descent and people of color in a poor and the fifth largest economy. This growth at all costs model has repeatedly ignored the most tragic human cost of the business. Injury, contribution to poverty, loss of life, resulting in a sharecropping model in which leaves workers with no recourse, no remedies, and no protections. And while gig corporations refused to protect their workers, they were quick to spend over $200 million on Proposition 22 a California ballot measure written for and paid for by Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and other gig corporations. It's with Prop 22 gig corporations intended to up in labor protections and rewrite California law to make legal the expectation of gig workers, and they're coming to a town near you. They others thinking that they were for racial justice, running ads, quoting Meyer Angelou, or buying billboards stating if you tolerate racism, delete Uber. They work tirelessly to exploit racial justice movements in an effort to cover up the truth that these corporations rely entirely on the expectation, exploitation of workers. Under Proposition 22, um, we are a workforce entirely managed by an algorithm. We're told that we have flexibility, but if we choose not to accept a ride, or ask the customer to leave our vehicle for refusing to wear a mask, we are penalized. This and so many other um, infractions, it's why it's important um, that we begin to talk about a technology to bridge um, divides to include those on the margins. That's why it's absolutely crucial for lawmakers to listen to real black and brown drivers who can tell their truth. I will talk a little bit more about what that looks like later on, but I will say this. Black and brown workers understand more than anyone the links profiteers would go to build legal loopholes so that they can have full access to our bodies, to our label, labor, without any recourse for workers. And that's why it's important Congress should act boldly to free our society from the violence, poverty, and low wages by protecting gig workers and ensuring that we have essential and equal rights at work, including employee protections under federal law. The reality of gig workers is not reflective of a just and equitable society. And so I'm glad that we're having the time to talk about this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Without further, and now we'll move for our third speaker, to Sue Bashish. Um, thank you, Emmett, and thank you all of you for joining. Um, I would uh, address the question around um, how technology is creating different problems, and, and so the second question, how is technology for belonging created differently than technology that others? Um, the three things that I've been thinking about when I think of uh, the predatory inclusion uh, it's it's the it's the sort of whitewashing um, in the name of inclusion where um, certain uh, kinds of inclusion are given to people uh, that are marginalized and are presented as their inclu inclusion. So, uh, for instance, if um, if a company that's making fast fashion brands, uh, uh, fast fashion uh, products, uh, and they are creating the X Foundation to uh, recycle the products that they're creating themselves. That's that's the kind of um, uh, uh, that I mean that thinking of that, and then the equivalent of that in technology could be uh, called the predatory inclusion. And the three things that I think about that one is uh, something that I was working on uh, during 2019 and 20 um, on the biometric ID of India, Aadhaar, uh, which was created. Uh, 10 years back, uh, actually more uh, now. Uh, and the idea was to provide each resident of uh, India uh, this biometric ID and put their details, their personal details into a database, a large database um, that are um, located into, uh, that are saved in two different data centers. 
And um, what happened is uh, right after that was created, um, it was presented to the people that it's optional. Uh, so people uh, could voluntarily enroll for uh, this ID. Uh, but what happened in reality is every single thing, private and public uh, amenities that people have access to or people have to use were linked uh, to Aadhaar. So there's something called KYC, know your customer. And every single private service in India started to use uh, as their uh, de facto uh, authentication method. So, um, and, and so um, uh, the basic amenities like ration or um, food grains, things that people would, uh, there's a category called below poverty line. So every, every single citizen that has to uh, get their ration from the ration center have to use Aadhaar for their authentication. So people had no way to um, use any other ID for that and before that there were different uh systems that were there uh, for authentication in different uh, provinces but that was sort of flattened with the introduction of Aadhaar. and uh, people were told that um because their data is collected once and that could be used for multiple purposes so they don't have to provide that data elsewhere uh, but in reality the government was creating this huge database by capturing data from all different sources and collating that into a centralized database because that makes it easier for the government to surveil on people. So it was, uh, people saw all kinds of repercussions because of that. Uh, so I made a documentary uh, by interviewing people from the other side, um, as we're talking about others uh, here. Um, and I interviewed people uh, mostly that were affected. So marginalized communities like uh, people with disabilities, people that are indigenous, uh, or people, um, trans uh, sex workers, uh, and so on, uh, to understand how uh, their respective communities are affected by this. Um, the second one is uh, a company called Geo. Uh, Geo provided, uh, Geo brought down the cost of uh, mobile uh, internet in India to an extent that many companies actually got merged because they couldn't uh, stand next to Geo and compete. So the the um, the healthy competition that sort of existed before between, between different telecom operators uh, was um, was gone, and there was a monopoly of this company. But what I remember is when I was um, going to places to do outreach for Wikipedia uh, as part of my work, uh, I saw many students sitting outside these small stores because there was free internet available. So they had to uh, register. Uh, for the geo uh, free internet service and they could access that uh, just by sitting next to uh, these petrol uh, pumps or, and so on, so the gas uh, stations and so on. Um, and in that process, geo was collecting a lot of data, a lot of personal data of people, uh, mostly young kids. Um, and then, um, and that, that helped them to build a huge customer base uh, right after that. And now they're into uh, multiple other um, internet services um, beyond just the mobile uh, internet connectivity. The third one is the uh, Google internet um, sort of um, uh, services that is provided in most of the Indian railway stations. So the public railway stations uh, have free internet access, but one has to register and the app uh, asks for all kinds of details and that information goes to Google but the government facilitates that process. So um, this is very similar to the free basics model that Facebook had, where Facebook said that we will, through this uh, free basics app, uh, provide you many um, forms of access to the internet, including Wikipedia and uh, you know other uh, useful apps, but also the the walled garden of Facebook. So I think um, that's 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 really tricky because uh, when we talk about the public-private partnership, there is very little uh, benefit for the public. Uh, it's mostly the private companies, the corporations, getting benefited by the private data that they collect through these partnerships, and the governments facilitate that process. Um, so I think that that's the that's the problematic part, uh, and it's also a form of open washing uh, by the uh, by the corporations and it's it's mostly um, the governments being used uh, in that process um, but I'll, I'll talk about these things a little bit later stop here now thank you
Thank you, Subhashish, for going through those examples and, and grounding us in a context that may be, may be new for folks. So really appreciate that. We'll turn to Sujia next to close us out for speaker uh, presentation. Thank you, Aminat. And thank you for all speakers for sharing. It's very, insi it's very insightful for me as well. Uh, and uh, I'm Sujia. Today, I'm going to talk about how online harm is happening on social media and how do we address it? Uh, online harm such as harassment is a prevalent problem. To get some ideas from data, 41% of Americans has been personally harmed um, online and one in five have been targets of particularly severe forms of harm, such as sexual harassment, stalking, or revenge porn. And many of, them, of those harm target at um, minors such as teenagers or gender minorities. And despite ongoing efforts to address the problem, online harm has become more common and severe over time. Then how do social media platforms currently address harm? Most platforms use a framework called content moderation. Uh, as the name suggested, it focuses heavily on the content. Once the perpetrator has published harmful content, the platform has into real cases. Does content moderation work? Even given the condition that content moderation can implement all harmful content efficiently, that the framework is still limiting in several ways. And today, I'm going to talk about how the framework works or does not work for the two key stakeholders in harm, perpetrators who conduct harm and survivors who receive harm. From the their side, the moderation does not encourage them to learn from their wrongdoing and stop harmful behaviors in the future. Through my research, I've talked with multiple survivors and met perpetrators online. And they indicated that after an instance of offense, it's convenient for the perpetrators to create new accounts or move to another community. The sometimes it get away with nothing. Why will they change behavior? And it's true that in some cases, perpetrators do care about their own identity and suffer from their content being. However, punitive measures and the best education method for them to understand why they, they are doing it. And they may start because they will be punished, but there's a missing opportunity for them to learn from their mistakes or repair the harm they have caused. For example, by learning how their careless act have impacted others and to give survivors an apology and acknowledgement of harm. And on the other side, uh, content moderation is about actions between social media platforms and the perpetrators of harm. But people who receive harm, the survivors are missing the picture. Yes, the survivors can report the perpetrators to the platform, but it's the only thing the platform can do for them. Afterwards, the survivors are left out of the picture. Um, and it means that, um, so, Reporting is the only thing they can do, and there's no further response or support for them. Uh, it seems like the platform take care of the perpetrator for the survivors, but is this all what survivors hope for? Uh, I've talked with many survivors of harm, and I realized that they actually need so many things when harm has happened. One thing surprised me is that sometimes they're not even sure if they have received harm or if they're being too sensitive which means that without any guidance or help, survivors may endure the harm and blame themselves instead for what has happened. Um, so I also learned that they have so many other needs such as emotional support, safety, or transformation of our environment. And content moderation, as the name suggested, focuses on the content. But we may ask the question, does harm go beyond content? And if the answer is yes, then what else can we do to help the survivors? Um, in sum, I think social media platform often addresses harm through focusing on content, but we argue that harm go beyond content. And social media platform adopt punitive methods such as removal of content or bans to regulate harm. But we argue that punishment does not give real accountability to perpetrators and punishment does not meet the needs of survivors for support healing, and so many other needs. 
Instead, we see opportunities in restorative justice approach. I haven't really explained what exactly restorative justice is. That's it's a such broad concept. And I'm sure that some of the listeners or so panelists are familiar with the concept. Uh, I think now it's a better stage for me to explain it because after we've learned the experiences of survivors and perpetrators of online harm, what I can say is that what content moderation doesn't do is what restorative justice is capable of. Instead of punishment, restorative justice aims to help perpetrators learn from their mistakes and stop helping others, stop harming others in the future. And instead of ignorance, restorative justice cares about what survivors need and center them in the process of addressing harm so that uh, the community can collectively meet those needs. For example, in schools, workplaces, or in court. And how do we apply restorative justice online? When harm goes beyond content, the responsibility also goes beyond the platform. In fact, restorative justice engages community members to address harm which includes not only platform, but also online community members, the public, and this is a question, and a question that I want you all to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sujia. So we've covered so much through those presentations, I think. There's three lines in these very, very varied topics, right? Like what I, what's standing out for me is this, this theme of who decides, who's making the decisions, who has power, um, whether it's on the topic of content moderation or on the topic of the recommendation algorithms that determine what we might see online. There's also many comments around the business models of these organizations and how that plays a role in, in decision-making and the use of human resources and the impacts that it has on people. We also heard a little bit about what the possibilities are for new values for technology. We heard about the challenges of, in this example of the biometric ID in India, what is the role of consent? It was something that came to my mind when you were walking through that example, when you can't necessarily opt out. Um, and in Shijia's work, you've spoken about what would be a, a world where technology is created around the value of healing, around the value of repair, and of being able to, to hold space for accountability and not just for, for punishment and banishment um, as it exists in our current space. I also heard a lot on this theme of the power of, of storytelling. I know for, for some, it can be, this topic is a bit confusing given how little we have access to understand how these companies and how the technology but when you ground yourself in the stories of a worker of someone who is you know trying to to learn more about their gender about their experience um, online and and we see that through those stories how the technology plays a role so i just really want to say i appreciate each speaker for sharing a little bit about their work and, and about their perspective. And to the audience, please continue engaging in the chat if there's the topics and thoughts that this brings up for you, questions. Um, so we're gonna move for our last 20 minutes now into a space to kind of talk across the different topics that were brought together. So as I told our speakers, um, we had some prepared questions and I'm gonna kind of broaden them to be applicable to, to all of our work here. So the first one, I'm, I'm hoping to bring us to the topic of, of the conference at large, this topic of bridging. So in, in your examples of your work, there's so many different actors involved, um, people with power, people without power, institutions of government and institutions of private um, profit-seeking entities. There's so many opportunities in those examples to imagine towards this new future, what opportunities are there to bridge? So I'll start with that question for everyone. Um, can you speak to what sorts of bridges are needed in your work or that you would like to see? I'll break the silence. <laughs> so it, it, I have a long answer to that. Um, because of the 2008 uh, crisis, which caused a deep recession resulted in 
9 million people losing their jobs, at least 10 million um, to lose their homes, it pushed nearly 47 million Americans into poverty and widened the racial income um, gap. Um, and during that time, um, Uber, uh, the world's largest app-based company, emerged from this 2008 crisis. Um, they played on the trauma of, of um, black and brown workers. Um, what started off as subprime, subprime mortgage crisis sparked by de decades of deregulation in the U.S. labor and financial industry eventually um, erupted into the, one of the most destructive global financial disasters of our time. I say all of this to say um, that it's important to understand um, that racial justice is economic justice. Um, during the course of COVID-19 and Black Lives we've had an opportunity to become more aware that the same conditions um, that are perpetuating the killing and injuries of black and brown people are the same um, systems that are exploiting um, black and brown workers. Um, these corporations spend millions on a false narrative. Um, they tout talking points and pay spokespeople to erase the real struggles of, of black and brown workers who are driving their profits. And I will suggest to you um, through a theological lens that we need a moral framework around economic and racial justice. And it's vital we hear from those who are mostly impacted. A lot of times what you don't, and those are the people that you don't hear from. It's important that we hear about worker stories at the center of everything that we do the real stories, the real lives, what cuts through all the noise to listen to black and brown thought, black and brown theology, the black and brown lived experience of what the people themselves are saying about themselves, their experiences and not what outsiders are looking in to describe. That to me is, is part of the solution. That to bring workers uh, voices um, at the decision-making tables to really be able to start talking about that four letter word race. It's just really important that worker organizing um, involves being intentional about culture, being very purposeful about building coalitions that are black led. The reality is our cultural change takes hold through consistency and repetition and not just on holidays, not just on MLK day, not just doing black history month that rolls around that it takes courage, the kind of accountability and transparency to make a difference. Um, and I'll stop right there. Thank you, thank you. Other, other thoughts on bridges needed in your work? And then we'll move on to a question on the role of participatory design. So I think one, one theme, and this really picks up on um, Minister Sherry, what you were speaking on around the need to center worker stories and lived experiences. Um, one thing that really stood out to me from a couple of the examples here is how much your, your research or your um, art project, whatever the output was, was grounded in hearing from people directly. And so I'm thinking of the, with the YouTube Regrets Project where that crowdsourced research to better understand the harms of the algorithm from a people-centered lens. So I'm wondering if folks can speak on what is the potential for greater participation from users in the study of technology, as well as the design of technology. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. I mean, I think um, the thing that came out most clearly for me in engaging with you know, users of YouTube in our investigation of the platform was that the algorithm is not working in their interest. It's working in YouTube's interest. Um, and I, I think that's really significant because it gets to the question of incentives. So to talk back to kind of the, the business model that we started to touch on, um, I think that this discussion about giving people more agency and more choice 
goes beyond like giving people more options to tell YouTube, I didn't like that video, please don't recommend it to me. It's more fundamental than that. I think when we're thinking about increasing participation in the design of technology, where we're actually stepping back and thinking like, should the same systems that make a company, you know, billions of dollars a year be the ones that are deciding how many, many people all around the world understand the world around them and their societies, like, should these actually be driven by corporate profits, for example. And so I think that um, when you start to engage with people directly, uh, it, it becomes clear that their own made motivations for, for using technology might be, you know, to, to learn a new skill or to understand more about their identity. It's not to make a company money. And so there's kind of a, a fundamental tension there that becomes really clear and I think is like the starting point for being able to to um, figure out how that could work differently. Absolutely. I'll open the floor to, to other thoughts on this topic of what what new values or what are the existing tensions between who currently holds the power and resources to design technology and what you know, a new future could look like. Um, I'll quickly jump in uh, and I'll just go back to the same topic I was talking about earlier, um, the biometric idea of India. Uh, the design of that program, it's, it's a massive program. It's world's largest biometric uh, ID program, by the way. Um, the program started with one particular process that was, uh, well, the co-founder was involved in the uh, design of um, Adhar, um, Nanda Nilekani. And I think um, the design was participatory in many ways because the process involved people from the private sector, people from the civil society. There were many uh, civil society actors that were involved. In fact, uh, they used a lot of open source technology in the design. And that was probably the first time or uh, one of the very few times the Indian government actually used open source in their uh, in the core uh, as the core of the design what was missing uh, though is the uh, inputs from many um, activists many uh, rights activists uh, people that have been involved in many of the uh, workers movement for example or people who have been involved in uh, in say um, the rights of uh, mining workers and that's that's a very uh, that could have been um, the place where they could have harvested a lot of really valuable inputs because if something doesn't work in a place that has less connectivity, then that doesn't work for the whole country because the whole country, majority of the whole country lives in uh, in, in rural environments where there's, uh, there's very little connectivity or no connectivity. There are remote places. Uh, uh, India has the world's largest number of uh, blind population, for example. So many people are uh, either partially or fully blind. So if something doesn't work for um, somebody who is partially blind, that won't work for somebody who is fully blind. Uh, and the list goes on. Uh, so I think what was in what was missing in the whole design is that people who lived in cities, and uh, irrespective of which uh, category they fell in, whether they were part of a civil society organization, whether they're part of the government or uh, a private company, they all represented more or less the same kind of population. They represented people who have uh, access, who have privileges, and that reflected in the whole design. Uh, the design excluded most people, people that speak different indigenous languages, for example, that don't, uh, that are probably illiterate or don't have the same level of uh, understanding in the official languages. And India has uh, more than 20 official languages. Um, and, and that creates more uh, barriers for most people. Uh, and secondly, they created new uh, issues, non-existent issues. So one of the issues that was presented to the people saying that there have been a lot of leakage in the ration delivery. So there, there's corruption and there's leakage. So people that are sort of the middlemen are uh, funneling ration um, from, the, from the system and the people who are beneficiaries, they're not able to get the ration. And that's not, that's not true. That's true to some extent, 
but the solution was not a technological solution that would magically solve all the problems overnight just by creating biometric IDs and putting people's uh, details into a database. Uh, it is possible to track everything in the process. It's, it's not uh, that simple and easy. Uh, in fact, uh, there have been research, Professor Ritika Kera and her team have done uh, a, a good amount of research and many others have done this research. There have been more amount of uh, corruption and leakage after uh, Adhar was linked um, in this process. So to, to kind of summarize, uh, I, I, would, I would actually say that just by checking those boxes, saying that something is open source and something is uh, done by a multi-stakeholder, uh, quote unquote, multi-stakeholder model, uh, and everybody is involved and everybody is part of this consultation, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, what what really mm -hmm. uh, needed was needed at that place was to look at who are the people who would lose out the most if this is going to be um, uh, rolled out, and that wasn't done. And that's not done in most pla most other places. There was a contact tracing app, for instance, and the government did a big uh, release for the open sourcing of the app. Uh, so the source mm -hmm. code was put on uh, GitHub. Um, what was not available for people to check is uh, a clear auditing process, like many other open source software, where people can check, independently audit whether or not the version that is available on uh, on the build is actually the one that's used in the app. Um, so I think there were those loopholes that were sort right. of deliberately left for people to imagine. Um, and I, I think that's, that's where we can uh, start from. Thank you so much for, for going through that. I think that's that's a common theme of you, you know, sometimes we, we, we think that just participation and, and certain types of inclusion will, will fix things. And there's still so much important nuance there in terms of who's included, how it's done, what type of power is really granted um, and who's, who's in the room for those decisions. And another theme that you raised around thinking that a, a tech solution can can change deep-seated systemic uh, issues is another thing that I think has come up a lot. And I really appreciate that um, being raised. I think Minister Sherry, you've also raised that in terms of the history of labor practices um, in this country and its roots back to, to harm done to indigenous people, to black people. Um, and that that all shows up. It shows up in the technology, even if it's not deliberate, even if it's not said explicitly, it's 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 not possible to separate, and I think that's that's something huge that I'm really taking away from all these examples, um, these global examples. So our audience has a couple of questions, and I want to to turn to them now. So one here on, I think this ties pretty well to to your work, Shijia, actually around um, restorative justice, um, but I think it, it has broader applications as well. But how might companies themselves be asked to repair harm done by their algorithms or by their tools? Selvi Zabihia, sorry if I, I'm mispronouncing, um, but they also said, how might they be held accountable and use some of their own profits to repair? Is, you know, is that an, an opportunity as well? Sure, uh, thanks for the question. I think something just simply what companies can do is to allocate more labor and resources uh, in addressing those problems. I think when Aminet opened up the conversation, there are some data about pay uh, compared to the other employees. And actually, they, are, they have burnout and trauma of dealing with harm right now already. Uh, and if we go towards a more restorative model, it actually requires more labor from them. So given the current resources, the companies are given to moderation, it actually doesn't, it, it won't work that well. And I think it's a question about value, which is, it's not about how much company uh, spend and whether they can get less uh, perpetrators out their platform so they can make, make more profit. It's not that, it's more about whether they value the people who are hurt on their platform and whether they are willing to get more resources. So it's, we should think outside of their framework of making profit, but instead thinking about whether their platform have social responsibility to reduce harm that are happening on their platform. 
Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is, I think the companies should learn to collaborate with the other stakeholders to collectively address the harm. Although we try to blame the platform for what they do, but I think um, the online harm cannot be solved merely by social media platforms. I think it's similar to what uh, Brandy, Brandy has just said, which is, yes, platform has responsibility, but do we ask platform to solve the problem? There need to be other stakeholders involved. Um, for many uh, survivors I interviewed, when they are harmed, they have emotional needs and they turn to online support groups or they turn to their family or friends. Um, platform, of course, can try to help them, but I don't think platform is the right uh, entity to provide emotional support. But it doesn't mean they can do nothing. It means that they can collaborate with others and help the survivors to figure out ways and to get resources in front of them. Um, so I do think that it's more of a collaborative process, but at the same time, because harm happened on platform, the platform have responsibility to gather the resources for the people who are harmed because they are the one who provide the services and they do have to take responsibility for it. Yeah, that's a short, uh, probably long answer <laughs> to the question. No, thank you. No, that, that's really helpful way to, to think about the the resourcing that could be better distributed today and also just new types of partnerships and maybe unlikely partners that, that folks wouldn't think about immediately that a tech company might have to work with, um, especially at the scale that they exist today, right? Um, I'll turn to another question that I think uh, leads well into how we had planned to wrap up here, but if there are any examples, what Sully Moreno asks, what are examples of technology that has been created in a way that benefits community? So are there tools out there that come to your mind that, you know, are, are a great example or a good role model for what the future vision looks like? It's such a, it's such a complicated question, right? Um, because if you're not looking at it from a historical perspective as relates to the history of what happens to small businesses or the expectation of workers, um, I'm sure there are models, but more of an opportunity. And thinking about the last question in particular, as I reach step back into it, it's whether or not we are we a value-based society. Um, I'm in the business for self-determination and liberation. I don't think that if I was at church that I would see Lyft and Uber be at that same place. And so the ability to understand um, when we're using these app based um, when we're using these app based platforms that we're really paying attention. I'm not suggesting that we get rid of Uber, Lyft, Amazon, Kellogg's, John Deere, whoever is is in the, the frame of, of striking for worker benefits. What I am suggesting that as a society that we have to determine who we value more. Do we devout, do we value just getting from A to A to B and, and looking at these models that, as looking at these persons as objectives, or are we really in the business of creating what this institute wants to do? A, a community of belonging. And so what that involves is the reckoning, right? The reckoning of white supremacy and whiteness that is in us. This is a very simple solution, right? But a very hard one to deal with if we are not creating the spaces to come to a reckoning about how we participate in it. And so we're not gonna get anywhere. We're not gonna have the fine answer until we look at what is within us that creates the kind of contributions that we see today. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for bring, bringing it back to that. Um, yeah, this value based framework and around this uh, emphasis that it's not the tools themselves, but rather how we're oriented as society and as as whether it's a country or a global community. Um, I really appreciate that framing. And I know we're in our last minute or so here, but we had had a prompt earlier around um, if there's a daily technology practice that you might want the audience to consider. So we've, we've spent our conversation talking about systems, um, and I believe that that is a very important place to be. Um, and this ties to another question we got on practical examples. But if there's any that have come up in your life of 
here's a practice that I'm trying to institute or that comes to my mind to connect my systems level work to my daily practice. I'd love to be able to end with a couple examples. Sure, I'd be remiss if I didn't say to download the Regrets Reporter browser extension and Bartit, just kidding. Um, but really on the YouTube front, um, I really do try to, particularly for my friends and family um, who, who have uh, small children who use YouTube, I really try to teach them about the ways that you can, you know, turn off autoplay recommendations, like really practical stuff of pausing your watch and your search history on YouTube um, to prevent further harm um, while I try to work on, on YouTube from the systems level. So that, that'd be mine. And I'll drop some resources in the chat around that. Um, I'd go very quickly. Um, the two things that I would uh, like to share, um, and I don't know how successful I am uh, in these practices. These are personal uh, practices that I try to do myself. One is uh, understanding my own privileges. Um, and I think about that more actively now uh, because I work in a sector and I wasn't always thinking about these things so um, so deeply. Um, because I'm, I'm trained as an engineer and I was trained to think of solutions and not think so much about problems. And that was the wrong way uh, that I was uh, that I was taught. And I think uh, as I'm seeing more gray hair uh, on my head, I'm, I'm thinking about this uh, more and more. But I, I try to think about my own privileges, uh, my caste privilege, my, um, my, my access to internet, my access to knowledge, um, things that I, I personally have worked uh, my, my entire career and how lack of those access uh, that those access or those levels of access uh, prevents other people from uh, from even accessing the basic um, their own basic rights and how that affects everything that they do in life uh, and then be considerate and be uh, mindful of those things be more sensitive uh, take a few steps back um, before even uh, capturing spaces that I otherwise would capture. Uh, so that's, that's number one. I think the number two is uh, in any kind of design process that I'm involved in, or I play sort of a major role, uh, I try to listen uh, more than I used to do before. And again, I, I don't know how successful I am, um, but this is still a work in progress. But I think people can, uh, think in their own design processes, how they could in, include people that are otherwise gonna be excluded. Uh, and of course, each design process is different because the target audience is different. But uh, there's always, uh, there are always people that are excluded and it's not so difficult. Uh, it's, it ju just requires a few sort of prompts, a few provocations to ask oneself that who is gonna be excluded if this design process is rolled out and if it is rolled out just just as is um, sort of a default uh, setting when you purchase a new device so that that that's how most design processes are if it's rolled mm -hmm. out just just like that without any changes without uh, specific changes to to kind of cater the needs of people that would use then it yeah. would exclude a lot of people it it would in fact exclude majority of the people uh, so simple english for example is a is a daily practice that i'm trying to Use because I, I live in a country where only 20% of the people could uh, communicate in English. And if I use English, that's really hard. Or if my team uh, that is sharing communications uh, materials with people, that is that is difficult for people who are not um, very confident uh, or, um, or haven't read um, in school English, then it's it's just creating a barrier. And it's only including people that have uh, been privileged to get higher education and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Subhashish. I know we're at time, but we still have a couple of folks with us. So if there's any, Sujia or Minister Sherry, if you have any daily practices you want to add on, I welcome that. Just go very quickly. I think disconnect from internet, that works a lot for me. So just imagine the life without 
um, I think it's hard to not use the computer, to be honest. But I think at least we can disconnect from the social media platforms so that it helps us to re uh, reflect our life without this technology, to he help us see technology clearer and realize that sometimes we actually don't need those technologies. Thank you. It's very practical. And they had an outage recently. Maybe they were trying to help us out. <laughs> so personal, and I don't know whether or not, you know, it's, it's shareable, Please. but definitely I, um, just right before I got here, I mean, I love spirituals. I, I was born and raised in, in uh, Virginia, in the South, in the Black church. And so I get my um, resilience, my spiritual steel, from um, the singing that I would, would hear. Um, just recently, uh, a number of you know who Fannie Lou Hamer is. And so I was able to capture some of her um, singing that's been recorded. And so the ability to uh, draw from the roots and know that this is a long game um, and it's part of legacy building, right? And so it takes me out of my individual mode for success and career, right? and personification and really re reminds me of the connection um, that I had to the universe and with others um, as a means of moving forward. So that's what I do. Thank you. Thank you all so much for closing, closing us out with you know, some personal practices and um, grounding exercises that we might consider. and. Our director, John Powell, likes to remind us that belonging and a lot of the work that we're driving towards at this organization is aspirational. So even if it's something you don't achieve every day, it's about creating that goal and creating that vision of what you want to, to be part of in the future. Um, so thank you all our, to our speakers for, for sharing with us from your work and from your experiences and from the stories, um, both personal and that you've heard from others. Thank you so much to our audience for being with us and staying a little longer. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.